Yes, this is the question I wanted to touch on. Does God take into consideration mental illness for those who doesn't search for him? Uh, this great question. This is a great question. And it, it made me think if you've ever worked, mental illness is something that's very, has, has stigma among Christians, which is unfortunate because some of the best, I don't want to say best, that's not the right word. Some of the most influential Christians in history have wrestled with mental illness. One of the ones who was open about it was Charles Spurgeon. Um, Charles Spurgeon wrestled with depression before depression was even a thing. Um, I, I very much suspect that John Wesley did as well. And St. John of the Cross, when was writing Dark Night of the Soul, I am convinced that that was a form of depression and mental illness. But then there's other mental illnesses like, um, you know, things like bipolar or certain forms of dysmorphia um, or dysphoria, rather. There, schizophrenia, you know, all of the, there, there's just, it's hard to imagine given the, the care with which Jesus interacted with people who had physical ailments, I cannot imagine Jesus not giving that same amount of care and tenderness to his children, um, God's children, his siblings who have mental illnesses. And when you read the Psalms, we're going through the Psalms here on Disciple Dojo right now. I'm going to be, Psalm 18 is the next one we're going to be doing. But when you read through the Psalms, you, you can't walk away from that thinking, God doesn't care about people's mental state. And Psalms like Psalm 88, for instance, the darkest Psalm in the Bible. Um, what scripture gives us is permission to, to wrestle mentally with God. The question is though, to how far does that go? And, and this comes from typically the view that says you have to confess with your lips audibly Jesus or else you go to hell. And that's, that's not a view I hold to. Um, but one, I think of children, infants that die. Um, I don't think there's any grounds for saying that infants who, you know, a, a baby that dies from SIDS, that they go to hell because they couldn't confess Jesus and they, and they weren't baptized. Uh, so I, I look at that and I think it runs completely contrary to the revealed character of God. And so then I think about what about people with severe mental illnesses, like, like severely mentally handicapped people, um, people who the world would look at and say, Oh, they're, they're in a vegetative state, something like that. You know, are they any less image of God? Does God love them any less? Somebody who's mute, they don't have the capability of speech. Um, they do, they have to confess with their mouth. You know, like those are the kind of things where I think we have to say, listen, this is our theology overall, but always allow that God, one, he knows more than we'll ever know. Two, he loves those people more than we will ever love them. And three, if he was willing to endure the cross for the sake of a world that despised him, I'm pretty sure he can make arrangements for people in spite of whatever illness or ailment or, or mental state they find themselves in. This is why I don't believe people that say, if you commit suicide, you go to hell. I, I don't see in scripture that suicide is the unforgivable sin. I think there may be times where somebody reaches a depth of despair and of mental anguish that we cannot even fathom. And in that moment, they can make a decision that in their right mind, they would not have made. I don't think God goes, well, I would have loved to have you in my kingdom for eternity, but too bad you killed yourself. So off to hell you go, you know, like, I don't think that's the kind of God we serve. And, 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 and most importantly, I, you, you said this, I just want to underscore it once more. You can't find that in the Bible. Like the Bible does talk about one unforgivable sin and there ain't no way you can interpret that passage where it talks about the unforgivable sin and conclude that what they're referring to is a mental illness and or a decision to commit suicide. Like you, you cannot get that 
directly out of the Bible. Yeah. I get that it's some people's tradition. I, I, I've been taught that as well, but it's I just can't find it in the Bible if I'm being transparent. So re really good stuff there. Yeah. Well, and it comes down to because people are inferring. They're making an inference. So their theology tells them if you don't confess Jesus in this life uh, and you die, that you're lost. And that's a generally solid inference in general. If you, if you have the capacity and the ability to do that and you choose not to, yeah, you die in your sin. I do believe that. So I think you can affirm that. But that doesn't mean that if somebody who does not have the capacity or the ability or has not legitimately had the chance, you know, like, like somebody who lived in outer Mongolia two years after Jesus's resurrection, like how would they have ever heard the gospel? How would that, you know, like, are they just automatically lost or is God doing something? That's where I think we have to go. Okay. Let's allow that God is the one in control and he hasn't given us the specifics of everything. And it's a view that some theologians hold called the wider hope view. And it's basically, this is the gospel. And if you've heard it and you understand it and you are rejecting it, yeah, there's no hope for you. This is the only way. But there may be circumstances where someone hasn't heard it. They haven't had the chance to accept it. They, they are unable to comprehend it. it. You know, in the case of small infant children or severely mentally handicapped people or whatever, we just got to allow God to be God in those cases and say, I trust him. I stand what, with, with, with Abraham when God told him what he was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's first thought was, will not the God of all the earth do what is right? And then he barters with God, bargains with God to try to get it. And the whole time in that, God's like, okay, yeah, I'll do, I'll, I'll allow it. If it's 50 people, I'll allow it. If it's 20 people, I'll allow it. 10 people, I'll allow it. Like God is, is, is showing, and that's right at the beginning of the Bible, right in Genesis, showing the type, the character of God. Um, that should be our background from which we then approach questions about, you know, mental illness and salvation and all that kind of stuff. So. If, anyway, if I, if I may be so bold, since we've already read a scripture, I'm going to read a little bit earlier on in a scripture we were reading already. Yeah. Um, first Timothy um, chapter two. Let's start from the beginning. Um, verse one. First of all, CSB version. I urge that all prayers, petitions, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and for those who are in, tar in, in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, and now I quote, who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. I think if we, and, and, I'll, and I'll stop right there, I think if we keep that in mind, God's fundamental desire is that all be saved. Like, let's just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. You, you I, I think you really got to do an overt rejection of Yahweh to disqualify that. So the example you gave, you know, someone in Mongolia two years after the resurrection of Jesus that could not have heard the gospel, like literally could not have. My, my, my thoughts would be God wants all to be saved. So if they have not expressly rejected Yahweh, I, I think there's a, I, I could make a strong case that, you know, they will find themselves on the right side of judgment uh, when that day comes. I, I, yeah, I think it's, I leave it at the, the wider hope. I leave it as I don't, I'm not convinced by universalism. And I do think that even those who haven't, I don't, I'm not, I also don't believe in the myth of the noble savage, as it's called, where yeah. people, this, these unreached people groups, they're just idyllic. And if, if religion and Western culture would just leave them alone, they already have this beautiful relationship with God. No, no. I think everybody everywhere, it's, humanity is universally sinful. I think the leading cause of death outside the civilized, you know, cultural world was always murder. Um, you know, people, even in tribal region, like Papua New Guinea, that was the number one cause of death among tribal peoples was inter-tribal killing each other. Um, I think that you cannot find a culture that is not tainted and distorted by sin, but yet has God left himself without a witness? 
even in those places, even where missionaries haven't been or what, you know, I just, I don't, I, I think, no, I think he hasn't. Um, and, and ultimately the mechanics of how someone is saved, I don't have to have an opinion on it because I'm not the one making that call. Um, just to preach the gospel. And that's what we're called to do and trust God with the results. I do know this is something my dad told me early in life. And I, and the more I've thought about it, the more, more I agree with it is in the end, no one will be left out of the kingdom who genuinely wanted to be in the kingdom. Yep. And nobody will be in the kingdom who genuinely didn't, didn't want to. Kingdom. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, I just, I'll leave it at that. Let God handle the details. But, um, but this person raised this question and then said that, um, said their brother had just committed suicide last week. Uh, and says, I believe he struggled with Jesus. He had mental illness. Yeah. I, the first funeral I ever was a part of was I was a pallbearer in middle school for, uh, one of the kids in our youth group who killed himself. And, um, I, and then a neighbor across the street, her, dad killed himself, uh, when I was in, I think I was still in middle school. Um, and uh, suicide is something that has, you know, I've seen up close and, and personal. And I, I think one of the most irresponsible things we could ever tell somebody is, well, that choice they made in an instant sealed their eternity, regardless of anything else. I think it's just like, no, we, we have no idea what was going on between them and the Lord and God who knows people to the depth of their soul. Um, and like Gregory said, doesn't want to see them perish. So yeah. Anyway, I'm glad. I hope that was helpful and glad we could get to it. Yep. Amen. Amen.